experience podcast where we mostly talk about oh basically philosophy with a big focus on zen as that's what i do here (laughs) i've been wanting to start another podcast for a while dedicated to uh my beliefs you know my philosophy studies um just if nobody listens it, it helps me out you know what i mean it just helps me out to do things like this and it's kind of like a daily prayer with some people you know they have to have a little morning prayer so i just do it in podcast form as it relates to the buddha i guess my guest tonight is the buddha as you see here um we're also live on mixler so if you want to catch the audio version go to mixler.com download the mixler app it's a really awesome app and just type in my name i'll pop right up make sure you favorite me there If you want to listen to the audio version, if you're right here on YouTube, be sure to subscribe so you don't lose me. Um, If you have any feedback related to Zen philosophy or Vipassana meditation or Tibetan Buddhism, um, feel free to do so. Uh, (laughs) I haven't came up with a title for this episode yet, but it will come as we progress. But let's start off with um, the inherent nature of the mind is to make something out of nothing. Because the funny thing is, people say, well, you know, Buddhism is about losing, the des- ha- losing desires in life. You let go, you let go, you lose desires. That way, you're happy and you're not worried about anything. But they say it's a paradox because you have the desire to let the ego go. You have the desire to let the ego go, to let life go. Isn't that part of the ego? No. Or a desire? No. Because... There's nothing there. There's no ego there to let go of. And I I get caught up in this paradox myself. Let go of the ego. Um, Let go of desires. But but what is a desire? You're not supposed to... uh, There's no ego to let go of, basically is my point. Because I have that problem like if I accidentally... Because I'm human. If I accidentally say something mean to somebody that was being disrespectful to me... At like at a workplace, I'm like, I'm not supposed to say that. I'm a Buddhist. Why did I say that? Um, I'm trying too hard to let go of something that's not even there. So I just try to stick with flow and stay in the moment and progress that way. <laughs> and uh, so the mind is conditioned, has a conditioned tendency to distinguish forms, all of which are arising within the infinite field of awareness. And then each, then apply each. So I'm reading this article here. Uh, This is courtesy of zenthinking.net. Really good guy. So, uh, it's a false assumption, the ego. The mind mistakes its conceptions for a thing as reality. Then it builds a false sense of personal, separate self around such illusory contents of thought rather than with the intrigual aspect that the knowing of them like being aware of your thoughts in other words um because basically our mind is just a a never-ending story of anxiety and basically like i said stories just stories over and over and over the mind is always wandering and planning worrying and planning haven't you noticed the mind becomes hypnotized by the coming and going of the objects it perceives, all while overlooking and forgetting the underlying and changeless source of consciousness in which they arise. I try to keep it a little simple here, but I like to, you know, talk to, uh, you know, like-minded people in Zen that's really deep into the studies because it helps me. But, you know, I, I just, I just, you know, do the best I can with it. <clears throat> but what is an eye? But basically, meditation benefits will help you sleep. It increases well-being, happiness. It's not going to make you permanently happy because moods are impermanent. Nothing lasts forever. Things come and go. That's why somebody can't stay mad all day. Maybe some people, but moods come and go. Um, Just like anything else. So if you're happy, eventually it's going to pass. Which is fine. It doesn't mean you're going to feel bad, but... It's two sides of the same coin. The yin and the yang. You got the positive. You can't have the positive without the negative. 
You know, like if you have a job and you work hard, you get home, you're really happy. You get that little endorphin spray, dopamine spray in your brain, and you're happy to be home. But all I do now is when I when I work, I come home and I make sure I get my meditation in because it really helps me. Because what it does, it, another thing it does, it, it increases clarity. Clarity because, and focus. I have to have my clarity and focus at work now or I'm just miserable at work. Um, because I love being home, meditating. I thought about becoming a hermit. And I would. I mean, it depends. If I could find an appropriate Zen camp up in the mountains somewhere, I would go stay with these guys. But it's very hard to get in. Because like I said, I've let go of mostly of my desires. And the only reason I have a few desires left is because I'm stuck in the lay life. And I can't just sit around and be a bird all day or a tree because people think I'm crazy. Just like we have meetings at work and... They're like, Brandon, do you have anything to add? And I'm like, well, let me step into my so-called ego and say something. But nine times out of ten, no, I don't want to say nothing. I just talk so people don't think I'm weird. You know, and uh, give me one second here. One second, okay? Have patience. We are live, baby. Live. But yeah, I really love, one of my favorite Zen masters is Zen Master Dogen. <clears throat> He brought Buddhism to Japan from China. And I always enjoyed his Zen interpretation of Buddhism because they rationalized Buddhism. They had a more emphasis on, on emptiness. Whereas Tibetan Buddhism, they talk about the middle path and emptiness somewhat. Whereas Zen, in my opinion, in my view, pretty elaborates more on that. And Zen is poetry. You know, they, they teach you the understandings of the Buddha through more like poetry, riddles, the Zen Conans, things like that. And it really hits you. Master, what did those two trees outside mean? Well, when you figure it out, let me know. Oh, I know. Those trees mean nothing. Nothing. <laughs> you know, everything and nothing. But a lot of people think Buddhism's nihilistic, but it's not at all. I, I suppose it could lead to nihilism, but if it does, you don't have an understanding of Buddhism. Buddhism is just a natural way to live. It's just a natural life. You know, we're no different from nature. We're no different from other animals and creatures and so forth. We're all the same, and that's why we treat every animal, insect with respect. <laughs> You know, and I live in the South, and I'm not I'm not a big hunter or anything, and a lot of my friends, they go hunting and stuff like that, and I never pass judgment on them, um, but that's something I would never do. I couldn't harm another animal, even though I eat meat, but that's just how the world is. Like the great, the late, great Grayson Hall said, she said, she said, the world, people in the world are just a walking contradiction. It's true, because, you know, I don't kill animals, but I, but I eat animals, you know. That's just, I can't help it. It's just the money I make. I go to the grocery store, and that's just all I can afford. That's just how the world is. <laughs> but uh, the Buddha had a very great fondness for animals. And uh, he believed in non-harm, non-killing, yeah, all, all that. The Buddha was a vegan. But uh, anyway, in future podcasts, I might have... Eventually, I'll have guests on the show, hopefully. Tonight, my guest is the Buddha, which is perfect because he's there, but he's not there. That's the whole point of the prayer and meditation to a statue, because he's not really there. He completely let go. He's completely free. He's not there at all. That's the point of it, one of the points of it. <laughs> I ain't no expert. I have trouble explaining it sometimes, because the way I explain Zen sometimes comes off very nihilistic. I don't mean to sound that way, but it's in a good sense. Emptiness of doubt, emptiness of hatred, you know. All that is perceived, however, is nothing but the mind making virtual ways within the invisible, formless, infinite field of pure consciousness. The personal self, our ego, is imagined 
as are the separate objects of all thought and experience. There is no entity There is who is the subject of my experience. There is only a selfless witnessing of that which arises within the absolute reality of awareness. Which is true because there is no self. Because people, I like to think people have a person, like subsets of personalities. <laughs> you know, each day they wake up, they're a different person. But it's like seven subsets of their personality. Like a person might, it's kind of like work. You know, people come in on Monday, they're in a, a bad mood, but everybody's happy on Friday. They're a different person than they were from Monday. Now, you can say that's moods, but they do have different personalities. I've noticed this because there's no center to our life. Um, you know, I've talked with someone and I'm like, well, hey, let's go out and do this and do this Wednesday. And I know better than to ask somebody in advance because Wednesday pops up. She's in a different mood, a different person. Well, I really don't want to do that right now. and You know, things like that. So you have to get and I, I and one guy told me, he said, Brandon, ask me another day. He's, and he's not even a Buddhist. He was like, ask me another day. I might have a different opinion. That right there. So, are we really free? You know, but my thing is, uh, <clears throat> I'm with Sam Harris on the free will argument. But, however, it's been proven, well, mostly proven that meditation gives you uh, higher levels of freedom. So if you want this freedom that that you that you speak of, you can get it through meditation, because you'll you'll start to notice thoughts pop up in your mind, and you say, "Why well, I'm not going to act on that? I'm just experiencing anger," and you would you would rather be ang angry for five seconds versus five minutes. You know that's one way meditation can help, but you you just become aware of what's going on in your mind and these stories. And I wake up some mornings and I say, yep, I'm, I'm not feeling, I feel okay, but I'm not the person I was yesterday. I'm a different mix of it. It's kind of like the weather, you know. You are the weather, but the weather is constantly changing. Um, a man can cheat on his wife with another woman, for example. And the next day he could be like, why did I do that? I was just caught up in the moment. I was a different person. I believe in determinism, for example. Everything's determined. Um, we don't have free will because eventually we can't we can't just sit here and not do anything because eventually the, the mind's going to say, hey, I'm hungry. Feed me. Hey, use the bathroom. Things like that. So, But I, I, but I don't look at that in a negative way. I kind of look at it as the passenger in this body and uh, just see where it takes me. And through mindfulness, I try to have a higher level of of consciousness and awareness to where I can see th where things are going. If something happens to me, I'm like, well, what did I have for breakfast? I didn't sleep right. I'm all about sleep. If I don't get enough sleep and I get ill or something, I'm like, okay, it's from not having enough sleep, obviously. Um, it's just being very intellectually honest with yourself. Um, another great Zen teacher is Tech Nan Han. Um, you can find him on my channel. I upload some of his best talks, but he's always talking about just having compassion. Treat others how you want to be treated. And of course, you know, I agree with that. But really, mindfulness through concentration will help you. And the greatest Zen masters will tell you they have nothing to teach. Because the moment they say they have something to teach, they're adding a conception to it. That's not you're totally missing the point. Therefore, I have nothing to teach you guys. But nah, I'm more of a practical guy in that. Um, <clears throat> I just find the benefits of mindfulness useful and um, very useful, in fact, especially having clarity, being mindful. It's funny because, like, mostly in men, we're, we're clingy people, and I've noticed, like. I see females all the time at my workplace, you know, new people, they come and go. And like, I would have like, my mind will go crazy. Like, hey, I want to talk to her. Hey, she's cute, you know. And then the next day, I don't even think about it. Nothing against her. She's beautiful. I just don't even think about it. You know, mindfulness training really keeps you in the present moment. 
And that's the best moment to be in. That's all we have. You know, after after uh, death, there's darkness, I believe. And we are the universe. The universe is 13.5 billion years old. Um, and that's all we are. And I think Earth is like, what, 4.5 billion? And uh, that's all we are. We're just, all there is is now. Right here, this moment, is now. We are the universe. And the universe fades away. It goes, stars explode, planets die. That's us. So it's a miracle that we're even here in the first place. That's how you should, that's the perception you should have about life. Really enrich this present moment. That's all there is. You know, because you're constantly worrying about the past and the future. Those are illusions. Hell, even the present's an illusion. All there is is reality. Is the next moment to moment. And when you truly discover this clarity, my friends, you will uh, find peace in life. You, you won't even be clingy over that, that woman anymore. It just goes away. It's like weather patterns. It really is. <clears throat> and, it's, and it's a good tool for me. It's a good tool. Because <clears throat> I don't need to be in a relationship right now. I just don't need to be in a relationship because I, I'm I'm so I'm doing me and uh, saving up money, living on my own in my thirties, and I just don't need the stuff. I mean, I would love to fall in love, all that good, all that all that good stuff. But since it ain't happening right now, in the meantime, I can focus on me, work on my podcast, do my YouTubing, live on Mixler too, things like that, and uh. The funny thing is, once you get into the deep field of Zen, life is a dream. It's a dream because when you're having vivid dreams at nighttime, you're wondering, like, you don't even realize that you're dreaming, right? It's just moment to moment, picture to picture. It's the same thing with life. How do you know you're not dreaming right now? We could wake up at any minute. It's all a dream. None of it's personal. The personhood you perceive yourself as as an impersonal object that somehow spontaneously appeared on the consciousness that is your true self. Your person is not unlike any other object within your direct experience. It spontaneously appeared just as it was spontaneously disappeared. All objects are unreal. They are an appearance only with no lasting reality. If you want to see into the darkness of your mind, just simply open your eyes. But when you're in, yeah, there's nothing but consciousness. Um, some people think is their body is some kind of odd property or something, but you could be aware in your legs and feet. You could be aware anyway. There's a great book that just came out by Robert Wright called Why Buddhism is True. And the title's provocative, but it's a beautiful, beautiful book. It's better than Sam Harris' Waking Up book. So I highly recommend that. Why Buddhism is true, Robert Wright. But he had a story where he was he was in meditation, cross-legged meditation, um, concentrated very deeply on his breath, and he heard a bird chirping outside, and he couldn't separate the bird from his own thoughts. It's like the bird was a part of him. You're not one with yourself. You're one with the word. And it's kind of like I run this radiator heater sometimes. And it's very noisy and distracting. But as a matter of experience, it doesn't bother me. It's kind of it's kind of sensational in a way. It's kind of pleasurable to listen to. That's mindfulness. Just hearing objects and it's not necessarily bothering you. My only problem is I have to give in to this lay life sometimes so people won't think I'm crazy um because I'll say I have no opinion or no thoughts about that and and I'm still like that I'm, I'm quiet now more quiet I used to be very energetic and talkative and I still am sometimes but I'm just very very relaxed and that's that's the benefits of meditation and some people might think I'm boring now or Maybe I was always relaxed, they would think, but I'm nothing like that. If they seen me seven years ago, I discovered Buddhism in 2010. 
but uh, it's just really relaxed my mind and calmed me down as we should be. And I'm not that. I always say, "What's the rush? What is the rush? <laughs> You're in such a hurry to get to get nowhere." But uh, yeah, you can't let go of the ego because there's nothing. There's no ego to let go of. That's what I struggle with sometimes. And I have to tap into my ego to do a good job at work or and things like that. That's my unwisdom right there, you know. But I'm just trying to play it smart in the lay life. I would love to yeah, I, like I said, I would not mind being a hermit living up in the mountains, eating one meal a day and embracing nature. And being super happy and letting go of all this clinginess and unhappiness in life. People getting plastic surgery, changing their face, and all these silly things. Everything is alright. You don't have to be that way. And, uh, yeah, and like I said, I see a beautiful woman. I don't flirt or anything, but the next day I don't even think about it. It's weird. I paid my light bill last week. And I checked my, my credit card this morning. I said, where'd my money go? I got to pay my light bill. Where'd my money go? Then I checked the history. It said, Brandon, you paid your light bill last week. My, my recent transactions. I forgot. <laughs> I had a day at work. I forgot in a good way, I think. But see, I have to be a little bit more mindful. It's not about forgetfulness. It's just about being focused. <laughs> so, uh... Man, I had a day at work one day, and I didn't think about nothing. That was so satisfying to me. I worked 10 hours that day, and it's a trick to get through it, too. If you stay focused, of course you're going to think thoughts come and go, but that day, I swear I did not. I didn't think about nothing. All, all I did was work. When we work, we work. When we sit, we sit. But I worked 10 hours and didn't even think about anything. I said, damn, I didn't think about nothing. Because 95% of the thoughts you're having today, you had yesterday, right? So I didn't think about nothing. And that was probably one of my best days. But I try not to cling to it. Don't cling to it. If you have a deep experience, spirituality experience through meditation, don't cling. Or you'll never feel it again. Just enjoy it for what it is. It's like a, like a good natural high. Just enjoy it for what it is. Don't cling to it. It'll come back eventually. Let me see. The ultimate reality is that nothing ever happens, although it appears that things do. Hmm. Realize the unreality of the mind. You will see that nothing is happening other than the mind creating stories about this. And everything else which it subjectively analyzes with empty knowledge. And truth is only the mind that is happening, nothing else. It's just as the old Zen, Zen master said, it is the flag that, is it the flag that's moving? Or is it the wind? Neither. Only the wind is moving. See, I love Zen Conan's like that. You know. But even if this is false, the mind moving itself is, in truth, a non-happening event. As even the mind itself is a stuff of imagination. It is illusory. It is unreal. It doesn't exist. It only seems to when it is moving. The mind is an empty movement of mentation going nowhere. Doing nothing but creating a false dream of all duality. Of you, of me, and all of that divisive outside world out there. That seems to be ruled by suffering. Otherwise, otherwise known as samsara. The personal I, how you perceive yourself. Who is happening and doing things in this world. It is nothing but a dream. You must awaken to your personal objective unreality. You as you presently know yourself are unreal. You are relative only to the, to the conditions in which you conceptually subject yourself. The solution is simple. Empty your mind and be free. Return to zero. Conceptionally. Yeah, view the world in a non-conceptional manner. It's very hard to do. Like, a child may walk up to a tree and say, Dad, what color is that tree? Tell the child, I don't know. I don't know. Put that sense of wonder in a child. Don't, no, don't let the kid put a conception on the tree. And I just say that as an point of an example. <clears throat> uh, 
But uh, it takes time. It takes practice. It's a lifetime practice. But it does come in handy. If you don't meditate, but three to five minutes a day, it will, I guarantee you it will change your life. It will at least give you increased clarity. You can breathe better. You, you'll, you're more focused. You want to do more. But um, at this point in my Zen practice, I'm to the point where I'm sitting in my living room. There's a chair, a couch, a heater. And I don't even, I'm not, I see it, but I'm not putting a conception on it. That's true freedom. Your mind is placing conceptions on everything. We learn this as kids. And it does come in handy, obviously. But to see the true reality, to see clearly, don't add labels and conceptions on objects. Of course, this is hard to do. That's why it's a practice. But you get better with it as time progresses. And we'll be right back. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. If you're a Patreon, um, you didn't miss a thing. I took a five-minute break, but I was still live on Mixler and Patreon. So be sure to support my channel that way if you if you would like. I hope you're enjoying this. I'm enjoying it. It's really just self-therapy, if nothing else. But uh, my problem is I overanalyze my life too much sometimes. And the other day, yesterday in fact, I had a good day. I was happy that I didn't even understand it. It's weird because I was so happy. I was in the moment. I was socializing. And I just kept thinking, what's wrong? Is something going to go wrong? And uh, it's just weird for me to enjoy, to have a happy day and really enjoy it. I'm not used to it, even though I'm a Buddhist. I'm just always calm and happy, or I think I'm happy. But I was like super happy that day, a natural high, so to speak, a runner's high. And uh, a runner's high is very hard to explain anyway, as we know. And it was just strange to me. I'm like, man, I had a great day. I don't even understand it. <laughs> I was re ready for my back to hurt or my feet to hurt. That's the only thing that brings me down to reality, so to speak. The negative side is um, when I'm working and my back hurts or my feet hurt. <laughs> That's when I really can't focus as good as I would like to and really be here. But it's fun because uh, I don't hurt that much. It's just if I have a few days off and go back, so to speak. But as a matter of experience, um, like I said, this is mostly a philosophy podcast. But I'm going to try to have guests on here. And they will probably have different perceptions and perspectives about life. So we can kind of like snicker about that in the background, if you would like. You know, we can see how caught up in their ego and their con conception that they are. And uh, when there's nothing, there's nothing there. And uh, all there is is just just experience. You know, just this beautiful ocean, this beautiful storm. And you get that when people see this in reality, they get it. You know, they're they're free from self. You know, they realize they are the universe. They're just consciousness. Just just consciousness and experience, I would say. But, um, yeah, um, if you guys like the Sam Harris podcast, it's going to be similar to that. But I'm not, I'm not going to be interviewing people all the time. But I just, I'll, I'll, I'll be talking more about philosophy, determinism, and uh, Zen Buddhism, and Tibetan Buddhism. American Buddhism. So many labels. <clears throat> They've already added too many conceptions. But, uh, yeah, so I'm going to try something here real quickly. I'm going to add to, uh, uh, a couple of sayings from Tech Nan Han to close us out for this episode. I really enjoyed it. I wanted to, to do a podcast where I could, you know, talk to you guys, talk personally, and because uh, it's good for you. It's good self-therapy as a matter of experience. Okay, I want to end with a quick saying from Tech Nan Han. So here we go. It's about how to let go of anger. And, uh, here we go. Do you think that your anger has come from the outside in and now you want to let it out again? Are you sure that the anger is coming from the outside? 
That is a counter question. <laughs> In Plumlish, uh, we learn how to to deal with our anger, how to take care of our anger. That's right. Anger in, is not something pleasant. It's like the mud. But uh, without the mud, you cannot uh, grow lotus flowers. So the mud is uh, useful somehow. So your anger is useful somehow. It's a part of us. So maybe we learn from it. You should not get it out. You should not throw it away. If you know how to make good use of your anger, you can you can grow the lotus of uh, peace, of uh, joy, of forgiveness. And this is a very teaching, very deep teaching in Plum Yeah, we, we have been learning about this. Anger comes up not from the outside, but from the inside. Right. Because uh, we do not understand. And that is why we cannot love. And if uh, we look deeply, or we listen deeply, we'll be able to understand. And when we understand there is love, and when there is love, anger just transforms itself. You don't have to take anger and throw it away. Uh, in fact, anger is something that you can use, and if you, you, you hold that anger in understanding, in compassion, then anger becomes something like uh, love, like, uh, like uh, compassion. Yeah, compassion for the anger. Cradle it. I give you an example. The other fellow this morning said something unkind to you. Hmm? He did something, or he said something unkind to you, and you suffer, and anger is coming up. And usually, if you are not a good practitioner, you want to give that boy or that girl a punch. <laughs> you punish him or her. And that is anger in us. And that anger is a kind of mud. You could smear everything. So we need to be aware that that mud of anger we have to to handle, and do not let the mud to to smear us and smear the, the yeah, us. Smear So you may like to breathe in calmly, mindfully, and look at that boy or girl. And what do you see in him or in her? You see there, there is a violence in him, there is a anger, suffering in him, or in her. If that boy and or her girl is happy, he will, he will not, uh, he, he would not have uh, said something mean like that. He wouldn't have done something violent like that. But he did not, he did not have the happiness, he does not have the happiness in him, that is why. Uh, he suffer, and when he suffer like that, he he want to get his suffering out by saying something mean to you or doing something um, unkind to you, and he think that by doing so he will suffer less. That's not very intelligent. <laughs> so when you look and you see that boy is unhappy, there is anger, violence in him, 
and he does not know how to handle the violence in him, the, the unhappiness in him. That is why he suffers. And when he suffers like that, it's natural that he makes people around him suffer. So when you see the anger in him or in her, and you understand that anger, you are no longer angry at him. Poor boy, poor little boy, poor little girl, they suffer. I don't want to punish him, uh, to make him suffer more. I want to make him suffer less. And you smile at him. You said, dear friend, I know that you suffer. I'm not angry at you, even if you have said something like that to me, even if you have done something like that to me, because you suffer a lot. So I, I don't blame you. I'm not angry at you. I'm breathing in and out. I understand you. That is why I'm not angry at you. I do not suffer. You are a good practitioner. And he will be amazed. Other people will react differently. They will hit him or tell him something very mean. But you are not doing like that. You are reacting in a very different way with uh, tenderness, loving kindness, smile. And he will be amazed. And one day he will ask you, how can you do that? When someone said something very um, brutal, very mean, and does something very uh, violent like that, and you still keep your calm, your peace. How? And then you tell him, you tell her how you have come to Plum Village and learn that kind of mindful breathing and recognize the anger and recognize anger in you and in, in that person. So we come here at, uh, uh, as a very young people and we learn these wonderful things. And you might be able to share that with your, your friends when you go back to school. Absolutely. That is also a good question. Very good question. <clears throat> yeah. Boom. You have to realize the person, whoever you're talking to, is also you. You see yourself in other people and realize that person is just going through anger, frustration, he had a bad day. And just try to understand that. And they'll always come back around and apologize for it. Now, we all struggle with that when somebody, you know, like I said earlier, is mean to us and how do we respond to it. And uh, as hard as it is, I don't say anything nine times out of ten. I try to say, well, I understand you're having a bad day, so on, so on and so forth, but people don't want to hear that. They're too caught up in their ego that's not even there. And uh, in truth, you're already, you're already liberated since everything in the mind and suffering is just imagined. You know, if you're having a bad day, a lot of that stuff is just imagined. Like Robert Wright said in his book, he had a severe toothache, but after extensive meditation... It was more like a sensation. It wasn't pain anymore. It was just a sensation. Everything's imagined in the mind. That's all it is. is an imaginary uh, filter. It filters out feelings and so forth. Understand that nothing is as it seems. Everything that appears returns to zero. All appearances of phenomenon go back to the beautiful emptiness from which they unfolded. Nothing truly exists as we imagine it. Er, exactly. Things do exist, but not truly exist as we imagine it. You know, we're applying conceptions to it. Everything is perceivable as nothing but, but an impermanent appearance within the otherwise spotless reality itself. All things change, but that which always is, is the change of space in which all appearances appear. So basically to have the ultimate clarity, the ultimate freedom is to have an empty mind, empty of conceptions. Just really concentrate 
on purpose on the present moment. Especially if you're having to work, because it can really make the day go by. Enjoy the people there. Enjoy your time there. Don't cling to it. And then move on and, and keep it going. Keep it going. And eventually when we die, we have to let go. And that's fine. Then we're cool with it. I'm fine with dying now. I don't want to, but I can accept it. I don't fear death at all. And <clears throat> there's also a study that people in their teens and 20s fear death the most. But as you hit your 30s, you kind of let it go and let it go. And that's, why I'm, that's one reason I'm not married. Because, yeah, you can get married and enjoy happiness, but it won't last. And then you're faced with the consequence, the hardest thing of all, and that is letting go. Because if she passes away eventually, you're going to have to let it go. And that's going to cause you great, great suffering when you can avoid that. But it's not selfishness, it's selflessness. Help others, help other people because other people and animals are also you. And it makes psychological sense, too, to be a better person. It just makes things easier. Anyway, I'm Brandon. Look forward to having... I look forward to having uh, more guests on here, eventually. And uh, this is just self-therapy for me, as a matter of experience. Because I am a Buddhist for the past seven years. Um, and... Hopefully, I'll find some like-minded people because I am stuck in the lay life and people don't necessarily practice Buddhism <laughs> down this way. I'm the only Buddhist down here and it, that gets lonely, but I can deal with it. I enjoy the loneliness, the loneliness of it. I come home after work, I take my shower, and I enjoy my sweet emptiness because it feels so great. Freedom. I am the universe. You are the universe. Let's take 10 breaths and we'll end. By the way, the, the breath doesn't have to be forced. Just let it come and go naturally. But in my view, to start a good meditation, do like a focused breathing. Really concentrate on that breath. You're supposed to concentrate anyway. Then let it come and go naturally. But firstly, take you know long and try to hold it a few seconds. Release. That would just get you focused and concentrate. You know, get you concentrated more quickly. And then you can enjoy your sweet emptiness. It won't come right away, but it will eventually. Anyway, I'm not a Zen teacher because I have nothing to teach. <laughs> it's just like I said, it's just a, just a podcast for a layman that, that that finds his comfort in it, finds comfort in it. And uh, I appreciate you people listening to me. Um, leave me a comment if you ever practice Buddhism or mindfulness meditation, vipassana, med any kind of meditation mindfulness uh let me know because I'm trying to build a community and uh namaste